Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's session on BC 201, Christian History and Missions. Today, we're going to look into a few more revivalists, starting um, from, just give me a minute. OK, we're going to look into the general awakening okay so even before we could start with today's session request one of us to please start with a word of prayer can i have praisey can you pray yes pastor yes uh, can i pray in hindi pastor no english okay To Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful morning. Thank you for this session. And thank you for your liberty. Thank you for your We thank you all for the time you give us. And please guide us to the word of God. OK. OK, I guess there's a lot of disturbance in that line. Uh, can anyone else from the class could pray? Let's pray. Yes, yes. Thank you, John. Father, we want to thank you for this time you have given us to come together with you, together in your presence of oh God. We pray that this time would be a blessing for each one of us. Help us to know your heart and help us to sharpen ourselves once again and to be used by your, your mercy, O oh God. And we pray, O oh God, that everything that we learn today would be useful in the days to come, in everything that we are doing for the glory of our Lord God. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, John, for praying. So let me present... Uh, the PowerPoint before we could start with our session. Okay, I'm sharing. Here we go. Okay, I guess everyone can see the slide on the third great awakening. So um, we heard about the first great awakening and the second great awakening. So what is this great awakening all about? We see that the great awakening was a period of where religious awakening and reform took place. Well, it was a series of religious revivalists, revivals that swept through the American colonies that were led by the evangelical Protestant ministers. Well, the Great Awakening actually was a spark, was a spark that, uh, that uh, you know, that toward the English evangelical ministers called George Whitefield. So what happened in the first Great Awakening? Um, just give me a minute while I set the screen right. OK. Okay, so in the first Great Awakening, we saw that the, the first Great Awakening was focused on the church congregation, where we saw people were already a church member, and it changed their rituals, their self-awareness in the first Great Awakening. And, uh, and also in the first Great Awakening, uh, it, took a, uh, it made the church to come into a kind of formation. 
It also sought to make the conversion within the church com community. So the change was most within the church, where the first great awakening led to a division between the old lights and the new lights, so which is called as the revivalist or the new lights. So this, there was a split off from the congregation. So the Anglican and the Presbyterians uh, and formed their own denomination. And they were known as New Lights. And later they became the Baptist and Methodist. So this new revivalist Presbyterian denomination was formed in the first great awakening. And they also emphasized on the personal freedom and also a freedom from the slavery. Well, with that, uh, incidents or events that took place in the first great awakening, we move on to the second great awakening. So few instances I would like to remind ourselves even before we could move on to the third great awakening. So what took place? What are the major events took place in the second great awakening? Well, we see that in the second great awakening, there was enrolled of millions of new members who focused on the belief that every person could be saved through revival we see that the focus been shifted from the traditional evangelism and there was a, a transformation or you call it as a conversion from within and into different denominations so in the north we see the first great awakening resulted in the creation of voluntary reformation societies which led directly to the movements in the middle of uh, may approximately 1800 80. Well, in the South, we see the white evangelicals began to preach the Bible or preach the gospel, which supported the slavery, a notion that was in the interest of the slavery plantations. So keeping this in mind, we can move on to the third great awakening. So, well, the second great awakening continued in america uh you know the dates are approximate some say 1880 and some says it started in thousand sorry uh 1810 80. well the war that took place in 1812 to 1815 did not affect the fruit of the second great awakening as there was no significant decline in the revivals or the visitation and the moves of god Okay, so Charles Finney, a New York lawyer, came to faith in Christ in 1821. We will study about him later in detail. So what happened? Shortly thereafter, he started to preach. So in 1830, or 1830, in his first major campaign in Ro uh, uh, Rochester, New York, there was a great fruit with many coming under conviction of sin and being saved. So what happened? In addition to what was happening through Charles Finney across America, there seemed to be another move of revival. What's that? It is. It was estimated that uh, about a year. So in 1830, about one lakh people were added to the church in America. Hence, the revival was taking place in other parts of the world during the same period of time. So what happened? We see in Great Britain, the Methodist group experienced a revival. And we see God was specifically using an American evangelist, James Coggy. And it was during this time that William Booth came to Christ. So in Wales revival, it began in the south and it, uh, you know, uh, it quickly spread to the north. And at the same period, we also see in Scotland, God was specially using a man named William C. Burns. And in Ireland, he also experienced a powerful revival, which many describe it as the Second Reformation. So we see that the Christian Brethren denomination had its original at this time. So stated by John Nelson Darby and an offshoot of it led by George Muller. 
So in Europe, some of those who experienced the second great awakening became the carrier of the revival during this decade. So among these, uh, the few of the revivalist name was George Scott, a British Methodist revivalist or evangelist in Sweden, whose work was continued by Carl, Carl Olaf Rosenius. And we also see those whom he trained carried revival fire through them and it reached to Switzerland, France and now. Holland. So the revival was also reported in Norway and Germany. So we see many missionaries who had been ignited by the revival became carrier of this revival to the other regions. Titus Cohen, an American missionary, saw a great revival among the natives in Hawaii. So they were revivals in Australia and among the uh, pol pol uh, and among the other kingdoms. So we see the they also reported during this time at Cape Town in South Africa. So both during the Second Great Awakening and the General Awakening periods. Uh, yeah. So these changes were profound and many historians call this period in the history of American religion the Third Great Awakening. So like the first two awakenings, this was characterized by the revival and reform. So we see the temperance movement and the settlement house movement were both affected by the church activism. So as we know, in the third, uh, 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 third awakening we see that was taking place in many places, let's look at the individual revivalist, how God called them and, you know, sparked uh, the revival in and through them and uh, you know he spread the word he spread the gospel among the other people so first person we would like to study today is on charles finney so charles finney was born in connecticut finney was raised in oneida county new york so after a couple of years teaching in new jersey he returned to new york to help his mother who had uh, who was seriously ill so at the same time he began to study law and became an apprentice apprentice to a judge in adams so we see that charles finney uh, was converted at the age of 29 years and became one of the most successful evangelist of the modern times he was also when you look at his early life he was a very stubborn atheist and he was practicing lawyer in new york at the time of his conversion so we see finney first started with the presbyterian church where he encountered the lord and he had his life transformation and later when he grew in the word and in the spirit he was ordained in 1824 so we see that um, when you look at his background we see that he was an atheist but then lord had encounter with him which changed his life and then he was part of this uh, Presbyterian church congregation and he was ordained. So what happened? Hired by the Female Missionary Society of the Western District, he began his missionary labor in the frontier communities of Upper New York. He was a very rigid Calvinist, dominated the theological landscape. But Finney, argued his listeners to accept Christ openly and publicly. Because as he started studying, his perspective started changing on Christ. The word started ministering to him. There was no rituals or any kind of uh, 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 um, rituals could uh, could change his belief but then he was very open-minded and he started preaching on what the word of God says so his style started to be very different his messages were more like a lawyer's argument than a pastor's sermon because of the background that he was coming from at events 
at her events mills he was troubled that the congregation continually said that they were pleased with this so he set about to make his message less pleasing and more productive you see that he didn't want to go towards what the people were trying to be pleased with so we see that at the end of his sermon uh, which stressed the need for conversion he took a very bold step during this time so he made a statement like this you who have made up your minds to become christians and will give your pledge to make your peace with god immediately should rise up so there was an instant call there was an instant decision making there was an altar call laid front of people and it was quite stern for people to make a decision and immediate so the entire congregation having never heard such a challenge remained in their seats so uh, now you have to take your stand he said you have rejected christ in his gospel so the congregation was dismissed and many left angrily so the next evening finney preached on wickedness so he changed his sermon he, he didn't want to be men pleasers he wants to share the word as it is so the next evening he preaches on wickedness and his voice was like a fire um the words that he used was like a hammer like a sword that pierced into each one but he offered no chance to respond so the next night the entire town turned out including a man so angry so upset with finney that he brought a gun intending to kill Charles Finney but that night Finney again offered the congregants a chance to publicly declare the faith so we see here the church erupted dozens stood up to give their pledge while others fell down groaned and beloved so the evangelist continued to speak for several nights like this visiting the new converts at their homes and on the streets so he rode down uh, he rode to many towns and uh, that was known as the burned uh, burned over district so we see a reference to the facts that the area had experienced so much religious enthusiasm that it was thought to have burned out we see in newspapers and revivalist and clergy they took a notice on this increasingly rowdy meetings or meetings unlike those of the reserved calvinist so this was something very different from what was uh, how the people, other revivalists used to conduct their meetings simple that charles finney thought there's not much time left for people to accept the gospel so during this time we see finney developed the, what came to be known as new measures so he allowed women to pray in a mixed public meeting he also adopted the methodist culture uh, where the anxious bench it was called as where he put a pew at the front of the church where those who felt a special urge about their salvation would sit and he prayed for them he also conducted a, a a prayer in a colloquial or a common or a uh, the common language where people could easily understand so most of these new steps of or new measures that that he took actually um actually these methods were used many decades before so he opted for them as a new measures in his ministry so we see that this new measure became very popularized among the uh, among the congregation or among the people to whom he was ministering and it was very adaptable for the people to uh, accept it so we see that the zenith of finney's evangelistic career was reached at rochester new york where he preached of about 98 sermons between september 10th 1830 to march 6 1831 
So what happened during this moment? The word was spreading like a fire. People were accepting this word into them because the word has the power to transform and change people's lives. So what happened? We see the city, the people were getting transformed. How? The shopkeepers closed their businesses. We see people were urged by themselves to post a notice on their shops or on the, uh, the front of their business, urging people, the customers who came to the shop, uh, they, uh, they put up a notice requesting the customers to come and attend Finney's meetings. So this, and also uh, uh, the, the society, there was a transformation among the people where there was a report uh, from the police saying that the town increased by two thirds during the revival time, and also the crime dropped by two thirds over the same period. So in Rochester, it began an almost continuous revival in New York City as minister of the Second Free Presbyterian Church. He soon became, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, it was called as a Presbyterianism because of the large people being accepted and there was a change in their life and change in the society and there was a transformation among the people. So what happened? In 1834, he moved into a huge Broadway tabernacle which was built by the members who followed or by the uh, by the Presbyterians, the followers of his teaching. They built a huge tabernacle and they offered him to preach from that. So he stayed there, not for a very long time. He could only be there for a year because he felt his call was to move from one place to the other and reach out people for God. So what he did, he left that tabernacle. He, he, he raised another leader, Pastor Oberlin. Okay, so he handed this you uh, Broadway Tabernacle or the Congregation Church to this pastor, and he went about teaching and preaching into other places. So as he he started ministering to the people in different places, he was also appointed as a president of Presbyterian Church, which gave him a new forum to advocate social reforms, and he championed in that way. And he also abolished the slavery moment which was there during this time. So his few of the books, he wrote a variety of books and articles and some of it was his lectures on revivals of religion, a manual on how to lead revival which was inspired by thousands of preachers to more consciously manage their revival meeting. And he also wrote his lectures on the systematic theology. Teach. Um, yeah. So uh, some of them who followed the teaching of Finney, Charles Finney, and read through his books and articles on, and Uwe Blessed were Dwight L. Moody or D. L. Moody, Billy Sunday, and Billy Graham. So Charles Finney is called to be the father of modern revivalism, uh, according to the, some of the historians. And he also paved a path for the later evangelist like these three people, like D.L. Moody, Billy Sunday, and Billy Graham. And we see many other revivalists being blessed and raised through these lectures on revivals of religion. So with that, we will move on to the next person, Edward Irving. Let me change the slide. Oh, it was on Charles Finney. Sorry. Okay, some of the quote that uh, the, one of the famous quote of Charles Finney was, "In the presence of God is in the church. If the presence of God is in the church, the church will draw the world in. If the presence of God is not in the church," the world will draw the church out. So I thought this quote may help us. I just took it. And there's another quote, a willingness to deny self 
is the very spirit of Christ. It is the heart and soul of his gospel. Yeah. With that, we will move on to the next person, Edward Irving. So Edward Irving, 1792 to 1834, his lifespan was. So he began his ministry in 1822 as a Presbyterian minister of the Church of Scotland. Again, we see another lawyer into the revival. So we he led a small congregation of about 50 people to grow about 1,000 members within a month. So that's something only God can do it. So in 1827, we see after studying the books of Book of Acts, Iron began to challenge people to believe that what happened in Acts was to be the norm for their day. So manifestations of tongues, prophecy, and healing began to take place in his ministry. So Edward encouraged lay people to exercise the gifts, while this was not supported by the presbytery and church. While he believed in the deity of Christ, his preaching emphasizing the humanity of Christ being empowered by the Spirit to live a sinless life and do mighty works got him branded as a heretic. So his ordination was removed and he was expelled from the London Presbytery and Scottish Church. So Edward relocated and continued his work where people may freely exercise the gifts of the Spirit. Some of it genuinely um, and some of uh, seeking to replicate the Book of Acts. So some were following genuine and some were trying to replicate it. So without proper leadership and mature guidance, it began to go into different direction and self, uh, self disintegrated. So Edward himself ran into problem with his health and he died at a very young age of 42. So we see Edward Irwin uh, should be commended for his desire and willingness to pursue the outpouring and manifestation of the spirit, but it was not in that way. So he ended up in a abruptly. His ministry was ended very abruptly at a very young age. So with that, we will move on to the next person, George Muller. But before we could move in, I would like to share about Edward Irwin. See, every step that you take in ministry. You need to seek God, seek for his approval, see what is happening in your season around you. And we should not come up with our own theology. When we are not led by God, you see things getting diverted. And you will not be able to fulfill what God has called you to be. So we need to be mindful, have God's approval in every step, every area, and go with what the word of God says. Go slow, go with what the word of God says. If you need help, take help from the leaders who are available around you in the season, in the place where you are. Okay, so with that, we will move on to the next person, George Muller. Okay. So George Muller, a man of prayer and a great faith. I'm sure each of us in the class would have known, heard, or read about him, isn't it? So George Muller was originally a thief. Do you all know that? So through his conversion, God made Muller a man of great faith and prayer. It's a complete, a radical change we see in his life, isn't it? It just goes to show that God can use anyone for his glory to be made known, even a thief. So you and I today, if you think if God cannot change us, looking at our past, looking at our background, he's a great example to know like what is impossible by God. God can call anyone. 
no matter how big your dream could be no matter how impossible it could be for you for you to change yourself but when you just submit into the hand of god if god can change a murderer like moses if god can change a thief like george muller i'm sure god can change you and me isn't it so with that we will move on to george muller's early life we see muller was born in persia modern day german um I think I didn't pronounce it correctly. It's P Russia. How do we pronounce it? Prussia, modern day Germany in 1805. And his father was a tax collector. And George would often steal from his father. Not only was a uh, young Muller a thief, he was also a gambler and a drunkard. You know, along with one habit, you will have another few more added to it so we see according to muller in 1819 that means he was about 14 year old muller on the night his mom died was out and he was out with his friends playing cards at a tavern and spent much of the next day drinking so he, Muller was unaware of his mother's death. Muller's parents did not know the Lord either. So they had no way to train him in the way of a Christian life or a, a Christian life. The young George Muller was sent to Hale at the age of 20 to study to become a Lutheran minister, not because he was a believer, but so he could have a comfortable lifestyle which most of them do it right i mean even in these days we see if there's a rebel child at home you know the best way that they do is they send the child to a bible college to get themselves disciplined or if they're not able to have a comfortable life or they lost their parents and there's no one to take care they again send the child to a seminary but then something in the similar way that George Muller was forced and was sent into, uh, you know, uh, into a Lutheran minister. And what happened? Despite studying to become a minister, Muller continued in his reckless lifestyle. He would often steal from his friends. And Muller and a group of his friends went to Switzerland for a summer through Muller forging their father's signature so what happened here there was a life changing incident that took place for muller here so one day um beta one of muller's friend invited him to a bible study that met on saturday nights so muller had never experienced anything like what happened there so the students prayed on their knees, sang songs, and listened to a message written by a minister. So Muller said to Beta on the way home, all we have seen on our journey to Switzerland and all our former pleasures are as nothing in comparison with what happened this evening. So that very week, Muller got on his knees and committed his life to Christ. what happened later so after he make a decision or a choice to follow christ the young muller decided to become a missionary but his father disapproved keeping in mind his past so the young muller decided to not take any of his father's money for tuition muller prayed for his tuition to be provided for so one day some American professor came in to ask if he would be their translator. So when Muller found out it would pay more than the normal going rate for the translators, he agreed. So his first prayer request for tuition fee was answered. With that, after college, Muller went to train with the London Missionary Society to become a missionary of the Jews. 
So he became ill during this training and had to move to another part of the country for a time in order to get better. So while he was away, he became convinced that the imminent return of Christ was soon. So after getting better, Muller returned back to London where he quit his training. He wanted to start his missionary work right away. So he started preaching in Bristol. While there, Muller could not help but notice the orphans out on the street. He had to do something for them. So he started praying and asking God, what could he do? Well, Muller came up with an idea of starting an orphanage. So many in his congregation mocked at him, telling him it was not what they did in England. So Muller wanted to prove them wrong and show them with God being his support. So he, he could start an orphanage. So as he prayed for funds and workers to be provided for, people started donating to the orphanage and offering to help in the orphanage in various ways. You see, when it when the vision or the mission is given by God, God sends divine helpers. God provides divinely, supernaturally to get his vision birthed through the man whom he desired to fulfill it. You see, George Muller, the rest of his life as a man of prayer. So in 1836, we see that Muller opened his first orphanage on Wilson Street. At first, there were no children. And then he realized he and his wife, by now he's been married, okay, had not prayed for children. So once they started praying, children came pouring in. Muller had to build multiple orphanages because of the divan because of the demand that came upon. So eventually there were too many children on Wilson Street and the neighbors started complaining about the children. So Mullen knew it was time to start looking for a new place. So as usually prayed for a future home for the orphanage and the orphanage eventually moved to Ashley Down where there was more room for the children and for the orphans to grow. So what happened? One morning, the children were very hungry and had forgotten ready for school. And they all have gotten ready to school. And they sat down at the table and blessed the food that was to come. Look at the faith that they had. And all of a sudden, there was a knock on the door. And when they opened, they saw a baker. He told Muller that he could not sleep and he decided to bake bread for the children. And the next moment, there was another knock on the door. And when they opened, they saw a milkman. His truck had a, a breakdown near his orphanage, and he wanted to give all the milk to the orphan, orphanage before the milk could get spoiled. It was just enough food for the orphans that uh, you know they could have for that day. So this is how God started providing in this ministry above and beyond that they could ask. And on March 9th, 1989, Muller was leading a prayer meeting at the church where he pastored at in Bristol. The next day, March 10th, Muller died at the age of 92, where a whole procession of orphans who had been impacted by his work and church members um, you know continued there they followed the coffin and uh, the church members took over this mission what George Muller started and they uh, continued to preach in the church and also continue to take care of the orphanage. And after George's uh, dramatic conversion, he became, yes, he was known as a man of prayer. And he knew that God would provide for all his needs and even the orphan needs, that is, even for his children's need. And though the story of Muller, we can learn to preserve, uh, preserve through the prayer and that God will answer our prayer in his timing. This is one of the code that, you know, um, 
George Muller believed in, even though your prayer is not answered in time, but believe in God that every prayer that you rise, uh, you know, will be answered by God in time. So we need to carry this belief because he was known as a man of prayer and man of faith. Whatever he prayed for, God answered him. And he also believed that whatever the children in the orphanage prayed for, God was also answering to their prayer. So this is how uh, uh, God birthed a mission, a vision into him. And it was fulfilled by God himself through him. So just like how God fulfilled the call that was there upon George Muller, all of us in the class, OK? Each of us may have a call, a purpose that has been birthed by God himself. Let's look. To God, because He only uh, because the God given dream, a God given purpose can only be fulfilled by God Himself. He has the strength, He has the providence. So we need to look at Him and pray. This is what God is expecting from you and me. Look at Him and raise a prayer, a God kind of prayer so that God could fulfill his vision and mission in and through us. And, and he will send the divine helpers, divine providence into our life. And in the right season, he will help us to step out and step up for his ministry. Till then, we need to walk and hold on in faith. Okay. So as we studied on... George Muller, Edward Irwin, Charles Finney, and we also looked into the third great awakening. So let's look up to God. The God is a God of revival. The God who can do great and mighty things in and through us. So can we look at God and ask God, here I am. Here I'm submitting myself. Let that spark turn into a flame. Let this flame not be quenched, but then burn into me till I fulfill what you have called in and through me. The revival is not stopped. Revivalists are being birthed. How? By hearing the word of God. Hearing and hearing the word of God, depending on His Spirit. The Lord moves in and through us. Today, as we as we studied on the various revivalists, how God can do great and mighty things in and through us. Can we look at God and ask God, use me. Let me not be satisfied in the place where I am. Help me to step up and step out for you. Because God's work cannot wait. We need to remember this, friends. God's work cannot wait. Each one of us in this class have been called for different purpose by God. The God who called us is faithful. The God who called you and me is with us. He is holding our right hand and leading us. All we need to, need to do is just step up and step out like Abraham. And you will see the steps unfolding. You'll see your vision clear. You see a call being becoming clear, vision becoming clear. That's how the Lord leads us and guides us. Can I request two of you all to just unmute and pray and ask God, God, move in us. Let there be a fire birthed in us. Let there be a vision being made clear so that we can step out and do greater things for you. Can I ask any two of them to unmute and pray?
Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for calling us. Lord, we thank you for the great purpose that is behind us, Jesus. God, you left the 91, 19, chased us, and you have led us this far, Jesus. The dream that was planned by you can be fulfilled only by you, Jesus. Help us to not to look into our weaknesses, help us to not to look into this world, but to always fix our eyes on you, to always fix our eyes on the cross and the blood that you poured for us, and to move forward in this life with a great calling, Jesus. We need to save this world, help us to create revival all around this world, God. Take us in you since Jesus. Help us to always hold on to your word and to help us to give you the first priority. Help us to give your word the first priority, Jesus. Help us not to be distracted with anything that is happening on this world, but to always follow the pattern that you have got for us. Lord, I pray for each and every one right here, each and every one of my classmates. The fruit of the Spirit be birthed out of them, Jesus. Let your Holy Spirit fill them each and every day. Let us always focus on the gifts of the Spirit and the, in your word above everything, Jesus. Be with them and guide them each and every one of us here who have gathered in your name has a great purpose and a great plan behind us, Jesus. Help us to never give up on that. Help us to always look into you, Jesus. Even as we step out into ministry, let us not be distracted by anything, but only uh, help us to fix our eyes only on you, Jesus, only on spreading your gospel. Jesus, you be with us. You be our strength. Just like how David calls towards you, like, God, you're my strength. God, you're an ever-present uh, help for us in trouble, Jesus. Thank you for being our ever-present help. Thank you for being with us. That the desire that is burning in our heart today keep burning more and more on these upcoming days, Jesus. As we are reading about these great leaders who have created a great revival and a great awakening among the people, Lord. As we read about it, help us to be inspired and to be just like them and to do greater things than these people, Jesus. Lead us and guide us. We need you, Jesus. It's you who is working within us. Help us to reveal who you are to this world, Jesus. You're amazing and we love you. I pray for each and every one. Be with us and guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 One more person. Can I request one more person? Who have not prayed before. Brother Lubega or Subhashish, would you like to pray? Hello? Let's pray. Yes. Let's pray. Father, Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful day. We thank you for the gift of life that you've given us, Lord. We also thank you for the pastor, for the lessons she has given us about the third awakening, Lord. We know we, she's doing this great work so that we can multiply and do more of the kingdom's work, Lord. Lord, I also pray that let my friends and I in the class not be just hearers of the word, but also doers of the word. We do pray in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and everybody say, Amen. 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 Thank you so much for joining in today's class. So see you all in next week, next class during the week. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. God bless.